everybody and welcome to our 42 courses speaker series. Some people are still just joining us. You'll just get yourself settled in today uh, on what for me is a Thursday afternoon. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, already, know me already, I'm Louise Ward, 42 courses. And you can put your questions in the chat. I'd love it if you chat to each other. It's lovely to see everybody making comments as these events go on. So as I say, you're all very welcome. And today, Heather Lefebvre, you are very welcome to our 42 Courses Speaker Series. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be here. Nice to see all of you. So for those of you who don't know Heather, Heather is a brand consultant. She's also an author of Brain Surfing in 2015. And as I was just saying to Heather when she joined me, still receiving such lovely messages in LinkedIn, people, uh, and I'm sure from many other directions as well, Heather, people who are possibly just discovering your book. And also what interests me so much is Heather's had what some people call a squiggly career. She's branched off into healthcare, into a very specialised subject of craniosacral therapy. In fact, tell me how you pronounce that. Is that right? You, you did it perfectly. Craniosacral <laughs> Exactly. Which, yeah. which super. We'd love to hear a bit about that as well later on. And I said to Heather, we're happy to go in any direction she wants to go in. So Heather, just for those of the people who are joining us who don't know fully about yourself and your career, maybe you'd like to just introduce yourself. Sure. Um, thank you for having me. It's nice to meet all of you. Um, I'm originally from Texas in the US and I went to school and discovered this concept of brand strategy, account planning early on in grad school. And I've been doing that as a career ever since. I worked in Houston. I worked in Boston, Richmond, Virginia, Miami. And at that point, I really wanted to live overseas and have that experience. So I started looking into applying to the foreign service or doing you know, some kind of other work overseas because it didn't really occur to me that I could keep doing the work that I love in another place. But because I had done a survey for many years of people who do this kind of strategy work, a few people knew me and that enabled me to get a job in Amsterdam. And I worked there for five years uh, tribal DDB and strawberry frog. And, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty cool, you know, growing up in Texas when like your meetings are in Dubai and Milan, <laughs> you know, so it was, it was a fun experience. However, after about 14 years of experience, I still often would start projects and, you know, have anxiety and feel like, uh, you know, the imposter syndrome kind of thing of like, I don't necessarily know what to do. And also there were, there were just so many different doors opening to strategists. So you can be a strategist in innovation. You can specialize in social media, digital transformation. It's like, what are, what are the ways in which I want to be a strategist? So, um, Instead, you know, I already had a master's degree. So it's like, do you keep going to school? Do you just keep working and meeting people? I had read a lot of those different books where it was a person doing an experiment for a year. So there's like the book Living Biblically, where the guy followed the rules of the Bible. There's Gretchen Rubin's The Happiness Project, where she took different pillars of happiness psychology and applied them to her life for different months. So those kinds of things got in under my skin and my brain. And I thought, you know, could I apprentice with different people out there in the world and ask them, you know, Hey, can I work with you? Yes, man. Yeah, that's great. Saying yes to everything for a year. Exactly. So I was asked, can I apprentice myself to you, work with you? And oh, by the way, can I live in your house while I do it so that I can afford to make this happen? And amazingly, nine people agreed to that. And particularly like in a post-COVID world and even, you know, that I genuinely see how being female was an advantage. You know, I don't think most of these families would have allowed a strange man to come into their house, but a strange woman, slightly less weird, you know? And um, I went to Hong Kong, Singapore, Beijing, Shanghai, three folks in London. Oh, Brian Miller is one of the folks from London. He's saying hi, yep. 
Um, also went to Scotland and Seattle. And I worked in all kinds of different, you know, like Brian Miller is uh, doing like innovation strategy and like other folks were doing social media strategy. And it really opened my eyes and, and really uh, advanced my skill set too. So it helped me develop these relationships with people that I continued to work with and have, have continued to be generous and be mentors to me in my, you know, the ongoing years since. And then the book has really become like my, you know, instead of having a business card or, a, you know, <laughs> it's something that I can give to people and they can, particularly being a strategist, seeing how someone communicates in writing is so important. And this is 76,000 words of <laughs> my writing output. So, I mean, Heather, you've touched on so many subjects there that I think lots of people will you know, feel they relate to, you know, imposter syndrome is something that's talked about so much these days. People are so much more honest and open. You touch sort of on the subject of when do I become an expert? You know, you obviously had a lot of experience. You were qualified with your master's, but still there's this feeling of what what is what is an expert? And then I loved that this approach that you took is something that I think a lot of people don't realize, which is that when you reach out to people, most of the time they will they will say yes and uh, people are often surprised about that were they surprised that so many people had agreed to your project the way that it transpired over time was you know at the time people read people's blogs more often so I just put out there in the survey and on the blog that I was interested in doing this and I wrote to a couple of people that I had a little bit closer of a relationship with like Rob Campbell who was at Wyden in Shanghai he's since gone on to um, he's in New Zealand now, um, but them sending me back messages saying like, I love this idea mm -hmm. or, you know, having a few people having said yes made me, I, I, you know, I started it with only like four people having said yes. So the, the other yeses came in over time. So, And for those of you who don't know the book, it's basically uh, visiting and learning from what would be at now and at the time the top sort of marketing strategies strategists in the world and again that concept of learning from people as opposed to sort of textbook learning the value of that would you like to maybe sort of touch on how you felt you learned differently in that way sure um, the book, The Craftsman by Richard Sennett was really impactful toward me and where they talk about how people learn their different skill sets and the way that it used to be apprentice, then journeyman, and then master. And that's how you become a master. So this idea of a journeyman going around and watching different masters and, you know, taking up whatever works for you and casting aside what doesn't before, because that's really what being a master is, is finding the lens of you. That's what I ultimately learned is that you have to figure out what kinds of things are you not only good at, because you can be good at things you don't like to do, <laughs> but it's what are you good at that you also enjoy doing, so. And um, again, you touched on talking about the subject of strategy, the way in which it can cover so many diverse subjects. Um, is that something that you think you've seen a, a change in recently? Or, or do you think people still need to be covering the skill sets? Um, I think people still do specialize. So I think you have to figure out, uh, there are people who are more generalists and they're skillful at that. And then most people choose some sort of niche in some way, and it's usually based on what they like to do. So I'm not the, the strategist who wants to really dig into the, the do quantitative that much. You know, I'll do it here and there, but I really love doing the qualitative primary research. So I get more of those projects. And um, of course, it it is very much uh, has very much been a journey for you uh, mm -hmm. lots of people talk about their journey but yours really was a, a, a physical journey as well as as well as a mental journey and I wonder again how much you think that really helped you with the travel as well as the diverse people that you spoke to 
Um, I mean, maybe since learning more about the brain, actually going to different, learning things in a geolocated placemaking way of like, oh, I learned this in Hong Kong. I learned this in Soho in London versus in, you know, <laughs> I learned this in that space. Because I have you heard of the concept of a memory palace? Uh, yes. Do, do yeah. we expand for anyone who's not familiar with the term? Just the idea that you can uh, use your imagination to create a space where you then attribute different learnings or you're remembering things and attributing them to a place. So I've gone through this life experience of placemaking and learning. So it is, it, it is, I think, an advantage in terms of how you learn as opposed to if you always stayed in one place. Mm. Well, we're all in favor of wide travel. learning and learn, tra travel, travel. travel as well. <laughs> learning and, and learning from other people. There's, you know, there's nothing like it. And then if I understand uh, correctly, your subsequent interest in the craniosacral therapy came from a, a personal health experience. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, I'll touch on Chris's comment first. Like he was asking if there's a strat processor model that I loved the most, or are they all kind of the same? They're all kind of the same, man. Like, <laughs> You know, the four C's are kind of a classic and everybody's kind of doing those, but there are, there are different ways of, you know, I see it as we do some sort of discovery, we do some sort of analysis, and then there needs to be some sort of activation of action based on those. That's what strategy is. And that's what everybody's doing, but there's, there are definitely different flavors to get there. So, but then uh, the, the health aspect was, you know, from Partly I had an abdominal surgery to remove a benign tumor and just you know, many cultures are like this, but in American culture, they don't particularly give you advice on how to recover from such an experience. And then on top of that, now that I'm where I am, I understand like if you curl up on a laptop all the time, your body will stick like that. <laughs> There's a property called thixtropy that the body shares with like marmalade and, and motor oil of like getting thicker, you know, and stickier if it doesn't move. Um, and that, that can happen to us. And we have all the, we can have all these restrictions in the body um, that I personally had used massage as a tool to manage my stress over the years. And after I was just experiencing this pain in my shoulder and my hip for a long time, um, I'd paid a lot of money going to practitioners because at least in the US, a lot of the things that are more holistic health are not covered by insurance. And those were the things that seemed to be helping me. So along my journey, I mean, I also, when I moved back from Europe to the US, I felt like I didn't understand the US anymore. Like when Trump happened, having grown up in Texas and feeling like, whoa, who are you people? <laughs> what are you doing? You know. So at the time I was married to a Dutch person who also hadn't had much of an experience in the US. And so we wanted to travel around. So we lived nomadically. And, um, you know, I worked on a cannabis farm for six months. I went to the national, most of the national parks. I went to the Red Pill Conference, which is like a right-wing conspiracy theory conference, sat in the back, you know, uh, and learned just a lot more about the U.S. and, how, you know, and giving me the opportunity to, to see where do I want to live here. And the U.S. is a lot like Europe, and we, where each state is like its own country and has its own culture in a lot of ways. So there's a lot of, of uh, permutations to consider and be able to, you know, work over here. So it takes a long time. So that's been sort of my meandering past eight years of working in all kinds of different places. And in the meantime, I had these pains and it was, it was parallel, the, the journey of, of working in strategy and trying to figure out and sort out the pain. And so ultimately decided to live in Portland for a while, needed to be in one place and sleep in my own bed. And I decided to go to massage school just because I wanted to, you receive about three to five massages a week in massage school. You have to be willing to also do that with your fellow students. Um, and after the massage school is broken up into three month chunks for a year, 
after three months, I still had pain. I'll keep going. So after five months, I still had some pain. And a friend of mine said, you know, you should go see my neighbor. I don't know what he does, but people travel from all over the country to see him. And he also sees locals. So I go to see Dave and this was a therapy where you wear your clothing. He didn't explain that much about it, you know? So you lay down face up and then he gently touched me, you know, in, in, in appropriate ways, but gently touching me. And I'm like, what kind of bullshit is this? <laughs> this is a job, you know? And I did feel more relaxed after the first session. And I trusted the recommendation so much. Like this is a man who, um, Dave Monet had been a, a famous, you know, a skilled musician. He worked with other musicians. He had gotten himself into pain and he got himself out through craniosacral therapy. And that's why he practices it. But he also builds trumpets and commissions, you know, for famous musicians, you know, so he, he has a squiggly career as well. So I, I felt like he was a substantial person. Like he had put all this effort into learning this, what I now call an assisted nap. You know, it, that is the the not over promising version of selling it. You know, it's like an assisted nap. Um, but the second time that I went, I felt relatively even keeled. But within five minutes, I started experiencing what's called a somatic emotional release. So I was crying for an hour and I very much was experiencing and could knowingly that I was experiencing. I have lost a couple of uncles to suicide, a friend in high school to suicide. Very sad things have happened. You know, um, I lost a mentor to an aneurysm. Ruben from the book uh, died five years ago from cancer, you know, so those very sad things can get stored in our body. You, maybe you've come across the book, The Body Keeps the Score. It's pretty famous. Mm -hmm. So that idea of, you know, you can process some of these things mentally. Like I did go to, to therapy and I highly recommend EMDR if this is something, you know, if, if, if trauma is part of any of your experience, but that may not necessarily do it. So craniosacral is another kind of therapy where you don't necessarily need to talk about it. And it's about finding where restrictions are in the body and they can be um, either physical, like if you've had a head trauma, like you play football or something, or it could be this kind of emotional trauma where the restrictions can't get stored in the body. And then it's craniosacral. So cranium, we're more familiar <laughs> with the cranium. <laughs> We're not as familiar with the sacrum, which is the bone just above the tailbone. So from head to tail, this is kind of head to tail therapy. And you see these different colors of, of bones here. They used to think that the adult skull, many of you probably have children. <laughs> Did any of you notice their skulls as, as babies? They go like this. Whoa. Uh, the fontanelle. Yes. Well, that's the soft spot. But did you notice the movement? of the skull, like it slightly would expand this way and this way. Have I got any, anybody noticing that? So that actually still happens as an adult, but it's almost imperceptible. There's still living tissue here in between these sutures of the skull. And they didn't really know that because most of the time when they would look at a human body, a deceased human they would look at preserved cadavers and that destroys this tissue. So folks like myself who study this particular therapy, we do dissections and we study bodies that are very recently deceased. They're totally fresh and they haven't been um, embalmed at all. So it's important to know that these bones still have a slight bit of give in between each of them. And there's a lot of them and particularly the pink one. Can you see how the pink is behind the eyeballs oh, yeah. and it touches a lot of other bones? That bone's called the sphenoid and it's kind of like the keystone of the skull. And what's also important to note is here is a model of the membranes that are inside your head. So can you imagine your brain around here, okay? and that these membranes are more like um, balloons and your brains are more like yogurt or sabayon, <laughs> one of my favorite desserts. 
and that you've also got the membrane around the brain and down the spinal cord. And it's a, it's a semi-hydraulic system. Hydraulics, you've probably heard from your car, you know? So thinking about hydraulics of smoothing the ride, there's a little bit of fluid in between these membranes. You've heard of meningitis. Mm -hmm. That's the three membranes becoming infected. So there's a very close membrane, fluid, another membrane, fluid, and the outer membrane. So that's what, and these, with these protect your brain so that when you turn your head, your, your brain doesn't get scrambled when you jump and land, you know, that's why it exists this way. It's designed for purpose, but if you get hit in the head, if you, you can get restrictions on these membranes. So if you can imagine this inside of the head and you're like gently like a tugboat on the ears that is stretching these membranes you know? And so that, that's, what's going on inside the head. There's other moves for the, the spinal cord. And then the extension of it is that this cranial sacral rhythm, this, this three to five ounces of fluid around the brain and spinal cord is in this hydraulic system. It's going kind of like a lazy river around bathing it in neurotransmitters. And it gets reabsorbed and 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 uptake, and then new fresh stuff comes out uh, about like uh, several times per day. And that rhythm gives us information. So most of the people who practice this kind of therapy are like myself. I consider myself a highly sensitive person. I'm going to be able to hear a conversation from farther away than maybe another person. I'm more bothered by bright lights than maybe another person. So the same way that we could line up according to height. We could all line up according to how sensitive our nervous systems are. So if I'm able to put my hands, and they're also trained now, I can tell the difference between your circulatory system, your respiration, and this thing, the cranial sacral rhythm. And as I put my hands on different parts of the body, underneath the heels, on the tops of the thighs, on the hip bones, on the ribs, you're feeling, can you feel the rhythm or not? And when you can't feel it, there's some restriction there and we should go work there. And then there's some other phenomenon, like I've done hundreds of hours of training now of this, you know, there's other phenomenon as you get deeper into it of when the rhythm is not perceptible to the therapist, the person might be going into the somatic emotional release. So we will then say, you know, are you experiencing some kind of memory or thought just now? Was that significant to you? It's called the significance detector. And, and we work together as a team of, um, we use a projective technique that this is actually something that is very similar to brand planning. If any of you have done the kind of projective techniques of if your brand were a party, what kind of party would it be? Would it be a backyard barbecue or a fancy cocktail party? In this realm, it's imagine you have an inner wisdom, an inner physician, somebody that has seen everything that Louise has been through her whole life, everything that has happened to Louise is on Louise's side. What would they say about whatever health issue that you're experiencing? You know, so somebody that's experiencing cancer might have the revelation of, shit, I just need to relax more about life you know, and then their whole body relaxes. So that's a long winded, but it's, it's so fascinating to me. And it, it helps me downregulate my nervous system and handle what is a stressful career mm -hmm. advertising, you know, marketing, branding, but it's something that I love. And I love engaging in the cerebral interestingness of it, but by doing this work a little bit too, to the soft, you know, whistling reed music, it, and and knowing that I'm helping people, you know, that's a nice balance for my life. It's a fascinating subject and a fascinating story, really, of the way in which your career changed. Um, I mean, I went to study as a mature student rather late in life. And what interests me is what impact do you feel this subsequent learning has, you know, on, on who you are? I mean, we change with each new thing we learn and as you said possibly it's helping you now deal with stressful situations that you wouldn't have been so comfortable in 
uh, when you were younger. Uh, I'm, I'm really curious as to, you know, where you think you are now with your sort of all this new acquired learning. Well, in the past year, I've also um, started working with a naturopath to, uh, you know, really improve my health. So there's a little bit of a, you don't want to get obsessed with it because there are a lot of toxins in the world that, you know, you can get really obsessed with how you eat and all the movement and getting enough exercise. So I'm a little bit too obsessed <laughs> and I'd like to dial it back a little bit, but um, let's see. Uh, Things that, well, one one thing I think about is like I definitely have a vision of where I would like my career to go. That is weird, you know. It's not what is normal for today, but I think that there have been cultural signals that it it, it could be possible. And, and let me explain what I mean by that. Have you seen the TV show Billions by any chance? Uh, yes. Good. Okay. So it's a pretty popular TV show set in a hedge fund. And there's a character called Wendy Rhodes, who is both a psychologist and like a performance coach is how she's portrayed, but she's also the head of HR. And, you know, I'm, I do see that more and more where there's like director of wellness. Yeah. You want a Wendy for your company? I want to be a <laughs> Wendy because there is, conversation that happens while you're on the table. It's not always completely silent and an assisted nap. So, and the things that are bothering you in your work, the problems that you're not able to solve in that moment, those are the things that you're thinking over and that, you know, create tension patterns and constriction patterns in the body. So it very much could be, in my opinion, you could do both. You could do strategy work and hands-on body work and guided fitness instruction. I, I'm becoming a Pilates instructor too, but let's not, <laughs> you know, like we should be moving all the time. Like if we're moving our spines while we do this, like I'm arching and curling my spine, what would you call that role? I would call it probably wellness director slash strategy director or performance coach. I don't know, but like all this movement stuff, we could be, it just, it feels weird, right? Like, why is she doing that? But I wouldn't have been in the pain that I was in. You have 33 vertebra and all these different muscles and connective tissue around them. And they need to move in their full range of motion every day. So when we sit still, we're inviting pain into our lives. Fascinating. It's so interesting hearing you talk about these subjects. I've just seen a nice question pop up from uh, Suzanne. Now, I can read your question, Suzanne, but if you've got uh, camera width, I could uh, ask you to unmute yourself and maybe ask your question to Heather. Can you hear me, Suzanne? I'll She's like, get yeah, back to the brand strategy talk. Suzanne. Yeah. <laughs> hi, hi, Heather. Hello. Hi. hi, Chris. Nice seeing you in person. Well, uh, it's really rude to be without camera. Sorry about that. I'm a little sick, so... Um, I decided not to put that on you. <laughs> so hi, that's me. You know, not on the okay. best of health. So I'm glad to hear about um, how you cope with your, you, you know, with the stress level. And it's Thank always you. good to hear that we're all in the same boat. But um, I, would, I would love to hear how that affected your work as a brand strategist. And also, I'm really curious, you've worked with so many great brands to hear a bit more about, um, you know, how you cr uh, approach your creative work or, you know, maybe some, some interesting projects that you can um, tell us a little bit more about. Thanks so much, um, Suzanne. That would be really I great. I think the way that it's affected me the most is in the kinds of, pro I, you know, I'm not, I haven't really been suited for full-time work for a while. So being a freelancer has enabled me to do all of these things and design my life in a way of where I can go off and do a four-day training of craniosacral and then come back and do this work. Um, and then some of the work that I've done more recently, I really love, like I said, doing that primary research. So stakeholder interviews, 
um, thought leaders in a category, customer interviews, and then figuring out what are the personas of the different types of buyers, what are the persona or personas of the most possible growth audience, and then what are the journeys that those people go through in terms of discovering brands and, you know, analyzing and choosing, having the experience, and then, you know, using and continuing over time. So uh, an example project would be, uh, I did a project with Venables Bell with Discount Tire and Tire Rack. So those are, Discount Tire is a very large tire retailer in America, and Tire Rack is an online seller of tires. So Discount Tire had bought Tire Rack. Both companies have very interesting histories of, you know, long term here in the US, both founded by immigrants who'd come into the country looking to make their way in the country and but had different audiences. You know, we we came to discover that you know, I did like 28 interviews with uh, the leadership of those two companies. And then we did different interviews with folks who had used those different brands and had also bought at places like Costco or, you know, Firestone, those kind of places. And um, came to find out that like the person that's going to the discount tire store is more of the person who wants to be guided. They want a sort of basic tire, you know, I want something good enough, you know, whereas the tire rack person is more of a car aficionado and they can tell the difference between an aggressive looking aesthetic of a tire. They can, you know, they care about how the road sound of the tire and the feel. And so they actually have all these different folks that you can call up and talk on the phone as you're debating which they're tire experts. They really, truly are tire experts. So the all that to say is like figuring out those personas, figuring out those journeys, having a workshop experience. Um, to to fine tune it and, and come to consensus together. One of my favorite activities uh, is coming up with platform concepts for positionings and then having the respondents uh, tell me like if I gave you a thousand dollars for this and you you were going to give advice to this company, how would you invest it? Would you put it all in on concept A or would you divide it up between A, B, C, D, E? And then I have the my colleagues that I'm working with do the same, the client and the and our you know agency folks, and we come together and compare the difference of where maybe the client sees the energy and the growth potential is different than where the customer sees it, and that can be a really eye opening thing. And then going to the end, taking that that insight and coming up with a final brand platform, and then ultimately like a, a creative brand brief is, you know, the kind of, that's a more complete project that I really like to do. I also, last year, um, an agency hired me that I had freelanced with before. They had a large strategy team of mostly folks with less than two years of experience. And the head of the department also needed to be working and couldn't be training all of them. So I came in and designed a multi-month training program where I interviewed them one-on-one. -on -one. And I would say like this is another place where my therapeutic relationship skills come to play of being able to use my skills and abilities to focus on another person and help them see insights into themselves about what kind of strategist they want to be and um, where to put emphasis in their career and, and then designed the course in a way that was bespoke to that group of people. And we worked together and then they did an example brand platform and, and creative brief for, for a brand that they picked of their choice. So that's another example of something I've done. Um, pitches helped, helped Venables win an electric vehicle account after losing Audi. So that was a nice win. What else? Fascinating stories there, Heather, and I think we're really interested in the techniques that you're describing. And I'm just hooking there on the customer persona work okay. you did. I'm kind of curious as to how you think that's that's changed recently. There used to be quite strict um, uh, stratification, say, in terms of you know social class and age group, and it's much more fluid now, isn't it, in terms of yeah, maybe yeah maybe you talk a little bit about that because I think that's very interesting yeah because I do think that's a shift like where businesses still will do a big quantitative segmentation study 
but I found it's, it's faster and better oftentimes to do it qualitatively. So just in a matter of, you know, 16, 25 interviews with people, depending on how many categories, da, 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 you can learn and, and have a pretty good understanding of, uh, you know, of the sorting that matters. Like, what are the reasons why this person is in this category? What are the reasons and thinking and emotions around um, the way that they buy and that we could tap into and be meaningful? What did we do when we were pitching to find the right insights to help the teams get the right answers? So that one, yeah, we absolutely did not have huge access to the client. In that case, it was a, I think it's okay to talk about this. You guys are in the UK. <laughs> so the brand is International Scout. It's in the press, so it's fine. Um, and Volkswagen purchased this brand and it existed here in the States between um, like 19, uh, 1950 to late 1970s. And it's a, it looks a lot like the Ford Bronco. Ford Bronco was inspired by International Scout. So there's a lot of nostalgia of this being connected to International Harvester. This was a sub-brand of International Harvester and International Harvester makes combines and other tractors and agriculture heavy equipment. So it has that kind of connection. Uh, so you've got the nostalgia, you've got the Americana, you've got the roots to, um, to agriculture. But then we did some interviews with folks who were, you know, tr people who buy pickup trucks and SUVs and who would consider electric in the future. And by talking to them and really, you know, understanding that, um, Partly the, the client came to us with this idea of we want to target middle Americans. And I found a stat where it was 86% of Americans consider themselves to be in the middle. So if so many people, if everybody thinks that they're in the middle, then it, it came down to what's some sort of psychological mindset thing that connects them. And, and the thing that bubbled up was this idea of respect. It came from a particular think tank quote that I can't remember it, but you see respect, you know, when you watch a reality TV show of like, you're disrespecting me of like respect is something that we, we talk about a lot in the, in the U S and it's a, um, you know, something that can be really quickly triggered here. So the way that we're making meaning in this case is like, this is an electric vehicle that respects the earth. This is an SUV that respects mother earth. And that really became the idea of like, how can we show that this is about respecting nature? And that became um, respect your mother became the line. So, and it was like, you know, your mother taught you this and it was, it's really gritty kind of language and tone and, but, you know, and then of course, like lots of beauty shots of the SUV driving in mud and stuff of like, yeah, by being in nature, you're respecting your mother as well. Yeah. It's fascinating to hear the journey of how, how that was created. There seems to be so much emphasis still on, you know, or this has got to appeal to gen z or but but we were really trying to find the, the core person as opposed to the age and the social class and that's a, a real core value that you established there but i think it's also the balancing act of the four c's of i call it what is the imperative what is the customer imperative what is the category imperative like imperative meaning you know what what must happen like what is this because of this particular time and space and history of this brand for these people what is the imperative and so and that also attunes a little bit with the craniosacral of energy I used to think being like growing up in Texas, that energy was a very woo woo concept. I have, a, I have a visual aid here. Louise, have you ever seen a toy called an energy stick? What's going to happen? I haven't. Met. Oh, can you explain, can anyone in the room explain how this toy works? What's please feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. If you know what Heather's doing. <laughs> Is it just static electricity or something from. So we've got Neural static electricity as a possibility. Anyone else want to jump in there? Suzanne's this looking is like fascinated. Kind of oh, you're just creating a, are you not just creating a circuit from That's like it. one side to the other side? Yes, exactly. So with this toy, what I couldn't see the person who said, 
I think that was Chris. It was me. It was Chris. <laughs> okay. okay, good job, Chris. <laughs> your, your, our bodies are conductive. And the way that we send messages from the brain of like, we should do this. And the motor control center is like, do it like this. Do it now. <laughs> you know, that those messages get sent with salts and electricity through water, basically. And in other words, you're the lemon. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> Yeah, you're conductive. Yeah. And so being able to see something like this, of when the first time I saw this toy, it blew my mind, <laughs> you know, because we did it in class. And so Louise, if I were to able to reach through the screen and let you hold this end, it wouldn't turn on. We would need to do <laughs> ET phone home with our other hands and then it would turn on. So you're holding this end and then that, the, that finger we're touching. Okay. If we held hands with everybody in the room, 50 people, a thousand people, it oh, would turn on. That's amazing. And then it, oh, it turns off. And it is kind of amazing. So back to that idea of energy. Energy is real. Energy mm. is being able to hear my voice. Energy is, is the light photons being able to allow me to read a word on a piece of paper. And energy is uh, around ideas that are powerful. So that's another place where I see it connect fascinating I totally did not know we were going to going in this direction when you <laughs> joined the conversation today and I can assure you Chris loves toys and I feel that he's going to leave this event and be on and Amazon, spend eight pounds on Amazon an energy stick. ordering yeah. one of those little toys maybe to be used in a video in one of our courses in the future maybe so you can all look out for that um, when I'm doing these interviews, okay, well, so if it's cheap and cheerful on a new business pitch, it's usually through connections. So that is another benefit of having a squiggly career. Of, I'll tell you the folks that we interviewed. One person was a former group strategy director when I was an intern in Austin. He since had left the advertising business and gone back to Midland, Texas to run his family's oil and gas business. And so he owns several big trucks and buys expensive trucks and was considering electric. One of the other people was my ex-husband's boss in Florida who ran a bike shop, you know, so he also had a big pickup truck. So it's just, I happen to know people and more and more, I like that way of, of recruit recruiting based on through people that we know that have these particular profiles that make them a really great customer. So one of the innovation companies I've worked with um, called Takeout in the UK, I don't know if you've come across, um, Judith Clegg runs that company. It's really an amazing company. And they're very, very good about deeply fine recruiting and like contacting people on Facebook who might be the right kind of person. So like one project I did with them was for Samsung um, with a high end range of kitchen appliances. So we wanted to go to see very fancy people's homes who had spent over, I think they had to have spent over $150,000 on their kitchen renovation. So we were in really nice, really nice homes talking That's about how they chose between Miele <laughs> and wolf and viking and you know those kinds of brands and would they ever choose a samsung if it were nice enough so but well, the, sometimes we do use recruiting companies they're they you know like for the tire one uh we had a list of customers from the client and then like finding the folks who'd bought with costco and others they have a database that they start from and and find from well it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you Heather and I really do appreciate you joining us today to share all of your stories and I think certainly it's been an example of a never knowing in which direction your 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 life and your career is going to go but also seeing how your learnings however diverse they are can always loop back and and reconnect and contribute kind of to what is your your core interest and I think that really shines forward from you Heather that you've got a you know a passion for your new learnings but we can see as well you're always drawing them back to you know what are your original interests so are there any final messages that you want to leave to the the people who have joined us today what's your leaving parting message 
Go to IAHP.com and find a person near you, IAHP.com, find a therapist and go experience the assisted nap. <laughs> that is well. I wonder, I wonder It will make you many, better at whatever you do. I wonder how many people joining us today will. This will be recorded yeah. so you'll be able to any uh, nap refer back to anything <laughs> and take, maybe take a nap whilst you listen yeah. to it again. Um, I really appreciate you joining us. Thank everybody so much for taking your time in your busy days to join yeah. us and to hear the wisdom from, from Heather. And I hope that you will all join us again for a future speaker series. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you for joining us. And thank you so much, Heather. Thank you.